climate system is relatively stable. There are these buffers that uh, Dr. Hansen was talking about. Things are progressing, but it's relatively stable. But we're in this valley. And at some point, we're going to tip out of that valley. We will reach a tipping point, and the Earth's climate system will fundamentally change. What that means is we need to be dealing with climate change now. By the time people see the severe change, we'll be in an alternate globe that we really do not want to be in if we want to feed people, if we want to give people security. So we need to deal with it now. There's some urgency. I'll just give you a little bit of sense of one, of the, one or two of the tipping points. Uh, if you look at the Arctic region, say in Alaska, I believe this is going on in Siberia now too. You know, classically, there were no thunderstorms in the tundra of the Earth. In the last several thousand years, thunderstorms have been rare. As the planet has warmed, you get more convective energy, thunderstorms are happening, and lo and behold, there's a lot of carbon in those peat-rich soils of the tundra, and they are burning. And that pushes carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere, and we're starting this positive feedback. Very worrisome tipping point. This is one that Dr. Hansen mentioned but didn't say much about and that I know he's scared to death of. He's written about it. I am scared to death of it. Many scientists are. There is a huge amount of methane tied up in Arctic soils and in the continental shelves of, of Arctic seas and, and oceans. Frozen methane, if you will, methane hydrates or clathrates. If we warm the planet enough to melt the permafrost or to warm those continental shelves, we will have a tremendous flux of methane into the air. Why is that scarce? Methane currently is the second most important greenhouse gas behind current warming after carbon dioxide. It is a far, far more potent gas than carbon dioxide. It's already a problem with what people are doing. And if we unleash this methane, we are all in a lot of trouble. I'll come back to that. I'm part of a group, I'm, I'm proud to say, called the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. It's kind of a pompous sounding thing, but what it is is an umbrella group representing about 150 of the professional science societies, mostly in the United States, a little bit globally. And collectively, we represent 1.5 million scientists. These are PhD level practicing scientists. And we collectively wrote a letter a little over two years ago to President Obama saying, we are scared to death by global warming. Our country needs to take it much more seriously. We need to do something. I love this language here at the end. The necessary transitions will require nothing short of a new industrial revolution. We need to be doing that now. This is what the scientific community thinks. We went on and, and also said, by the way, some of the societal responses so far have been counterproductive. We gave two examples. Making ethanol from corn, we said, is not a good idea, more damaging than good. And we said, you know, this new idea of shale gas is probably not a good idea either, probably more harm than good. The scientific community has said that. You don't hear that in the public. I woke up this morning to the TV news in the room and the American Natural Gas Association, you know, the 10 minutes it took me to shave and brush my teeth, I heard three ads from them about how shale gas is our future. It's nonsense. What is the role of shell gas? This is a, something I've been dealing with as a scientific topic. It's, it's widely promoted by industry. It's promoted by our president here in the United States as this bridge fuel, something that will allow society to continue to use fossil fuels and yet somehow put out fewer greenhouse gas emissions and it's an easy transition. Is it true? The answer, no, is not true. It's a false promise. And why is that? Just a little bit about what shell gas is. Conventional natural gas, I don't think I have a pointer, but conventional natural gas is over that way. It's just a pocket of gas that's accumulated over geological time and you put a pipe down into it and it's pressurized and it comes to the surface and you have gas. And we've been doing that for a hundred years. Well, that resource is running out. It's almost gone outside of Siberia and Russia. The rest of the world has very little left. We've been goosing that along a little bit with something called hydraulic fracturing, putting in, so far, relatively small amounts of water, 5,000, 50,000 gallons, and just, you know, goosing up the uh, formation a little bit. What's new is this idea of shale gas, and you can see the, the other well here. Shale gas is gas that is very tightly tied up in rock, does not just diffuse out, and you need to to have this incredibly fancy horizontal drilling to, to get the gas out. You drill your pipe horizontally through it, and then you put in massive volumes of water, five, six, 
million gallons of water with additives and things, and you break up the rock and you get the gas out, and some of that water comes back to the surface, and there are large water quality problems with it, but there are other issues associated with it. This is just to remind me to tell you that shale gas is new. Half of all of the shale gas that's ever been produced on this planet has been produced in the last two and a half years. This is a new phenomenon. It's also a United States phenomenon so far. Outside of British Columbia and the United States, there is no commercial production of shale gas anywhere in the planet so far. So it's new. The science is new. I published a paper in April 2011. That's not that long ago. That was the very first ever scientific paper published in a peer-reviewed journal on anything to do with shale gas. The science is new. Science is progressing fast, and the science is scary. This is our paper. came out in April 2011. We, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, a science, and I'll mix in some politics with it. The, the reason that gas can be promoted as clean burning is that it indeed it puts out less carbon dioxide when you burn it to get the same amount of energy than does oil or coal. But the problem is that natural gas, shale gas, conventional natural gas, it's mostly methane. I've already told you methane's an incredibly potent greenhouse gas, and so we really need to worry about it. small leakages matter. Turns out that if you look at methane on a short time scale, 20 years after you put it into the atmosphere, it's more than a hundredfold more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. That means if you leak 1% of your production, 1% will match the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced in burning. How much is really leaked? Well, the answer is we don't really know. In our paper, we did the best job we could of guessing how much is going on. We, we, we actually had a lot of help from people who work within industry. They leaked us all sorts of information, no pun intended. Uh, we had help from industry people and international agencies and, and government people here in the United States. What we came up with is that we think somewhere between a few percent, maybe up to seven or eight percent of the lifetime production of a shale gas well is leaked to the atmosphere as methane. And if that's true, on a shorter time frame of 20 years, the greenhouse gas footprint of shale, the blue here is the carbon dioxide direct release, that pink magenta color is what the methane does, expressed as carbon dioxide equivalents, all in terms of the same amount of energy produced. And if our guesstimates were correct, then the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas is worse than any other fossil fuel. That's at the shorter time frame. Methane doesn't stay in the atmosphere terribly long, 10 years instead of a century. That's the good news. And so over time, the influence of methane is less. So if you look just 100 years into the future, it's not such a problem, but it still means that shale gas is probably as bad as coal from a greenhouse gas idea. Well, this paper got a huge amount of attention. I was honored, I guess I was honored. By Time Magazine last year as one of the uh, runners up for the uh, Person of the Year contest. There are other people, Osama bin Laden was on the same list with me, so I'm not quite sure it was an honor, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our paper got huge, huge publicity, and there's been a huge amount of press back from industry. The American Natural Gas Association has paid for advertisements on Google and any other search engine in the world, including the New York Times. So if you Google my name, or if you Google Shale Gas Cornell, or anything associated with my work, instead of finding about me, you'll pop up an ad from the American Natural Gas Association, which will tell you what an idiot I am. That's been going on for 16 months. So the industry is very much in your face. They're clearly trying to intimidate the scientific community. I'm here to tell you that that hasn't worked. There's been a huge amount of papers since our paper. Ours, ours was the first. There's been a lot since. This is an unprecedented rate of science. Science is usually a slow process. Uh, some of those papers are critical of us. A lot are, are, are supportive of us. A lot of science is going on. And a lot of scientists have rose to the occasion, I'm proud to say. Let's skip through this quickly. This just shows sort of the, our estimates of how much methane's coming out. We use poor quality data wasn't much information available. Most of these other papers also use poor quality information. The Environmental Protection Agency started to look at this, and they by and large have agreed with our, our conclusions. But what we said is there's a need for more data, and that's happening. There are now people out there in the field actually measuring methane fluxes as opposed to doing the sort of hand-waving sort of things that we were stuck doing. 
And it turns out that the methane fluxes are probably larger than we said. Let me just say that. There's only one paper published so far. There's more going on. We're working with a group at uh, Purdue and Penn State doing some really fun things, flying around in airplanes, measuring methane continuously as you go over shale gas fields. You get data like this. It's really cool. That shows uh, as you go up in the atmosphere and as you fly back and forth and up and around, the, we're measuring methane continuously. The hotter colors show you where it, are, where it is, and you can see that there's a plume of methane rising up there you know, a thousand meters into the air. Turns out that's a lot of methane, much more than we had said originally, and it's coming from surprising sources. So this technology probably is worse even than we said. People are starting to look at leakage in cities. Nathan uh, Phillips from Boston University is looking at Boston. This shows each point there is a leak in the distribution methane gas systems in Boston. It's all over the place. Worse than we said again. Let's skip ahead. Okay, let me make one more science point here. And I just want to say a little bit about the resource. This is by, uh, it comes from a United Nations report which came out last summer, but it was amplified by Drew Shindell, who, who works for uh, uh, NASA Goddard Space Institute here in New York. It was published in January in the journal Science. And what it shows you in black there is the global warming average temperature that we've been talking about. Up to 2011, the planet has warmed by eight-tenths of a degree. And it's continuing to warm for the reason that Jim Hansen said, even if we cut down on greenhouse gas emissions. And there are four scenarios shown here. That top green line is the reference scenario. If society does nothing other than what we're doing now and continues to use fossil fuels. And what you see is it will be one and a half degrees warmer in 18 years and will be two degrees warmer in about 40 years. At those temperatures, we expect the permafrost to melt. We expect methane clath rates to be released from the uh, continental shelves. We expect to be in irreversible global warming if that happens. And that's certainly on the life frame of my daughter who's currently in high school. And I don't want to see it happen. The other scenarios are what you could do. The next one down shows warming up until about 35 years from now and then things start to get under control. That scenario is if the world's societies take aggressive action to control carbon dioxide starting today, and because of the time lags that Jim Hansen talked about, that's the warming trend you'll see, we still are going to have excessively dangerous warming. The two lower lines are what you can do if you control methane emissions, either with or without carbon dioxide. It is much more critical that we control methane if we want to avoid those critical tipping points in the system. We need to control methane. We need to do it now. Here in the United States, where is the methane coming from? It's coming from the natural gas industry. These are US Environmental Protection Agency numbers. It's worse than these data show. That's what our newer research is saying. Globally, animal agriculture is probably a little bit worse than natural gas systems, but natural gas systems are number two. We need to control both of those. And just again here for context, over there shows where our energy sources in the United States are coming from. 25% of our energy comes from natural gas, but the natural gas industry is contributing 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions from our energy sector, and that's because of the methane leakage. So that's the low-hanging fruit is to control that. Let me jump ahead. I want to just say a little bit about a reality check here. Our president is running in part on a re-election campaign that this is a good energy future for the United States. In his State of the Union message back in January, he said that there's a 100 years supply of energy from the United States in shale gas. That is absolutely not true. What he meant to say was that there's a 100 years supply of the natural gas part of the energy from shale gas. That's what he meant to say. And that's not right either. Let me tell you why. These are some estimates of how much gas is, is available in the Marcellus Shale Formation, which is the largest formation in the United States and the one closest to here. Our Department of Energy thinks that about half of the shale gas resource of the United States is in this particular formation. And the EIA there is the official government projection from the Department of Energy. But the smaller one, the 84 trillion cubic feet, that comes from the US Geological Survey. And that's the best estimate. Those are the geologists who really know. 
And after the election, the U.S. Geological Survey will come out with a new shale gas resource estimate for the United States, and it's going to be a fraction of what the President said it was. They already have that together. They're just waiting for November before they'll release it. Now, if you've seen shale gas resource maps for the rest of the world, and again, it hasn't been developed outside of North America. There's some exploratory effort in Poland and some in, you know, everywhere. The estimates, for the most part, for how much shale gas is out there are coming from the U.S. Department of Energy, and they are hugely inflated, hugely optimistic, because the political forces that run that office want that to be seen as a large resource. It simply is not, in terms of the science we can see. Let me leave you with one final number. This is actually from industry, and it's what industry thinks the total gas resources of the United States are, including conventional gas, including coal bed methane gas, including shale gas, and making highly optimistic assumptions on how much gas there is. At current rates of usage, the United States, at most, has a 20-year, 20 23-year supply of gas. Now, 23 years is a long time, but we clearly, even in terms of the resource need, need to be planning for some energy future. And in terms of protecting the climate, we should be doing that now, rather than developing shale gas. One final thing, the economics aren't so favorable. This is a, a study that uh, Art Berman, who works for the gas industry in Texas, has done. This shows the uh, economics in Texas for shale gas from 2005 to 2011. And the solid line there is the amount of money it has taken to, to keep shale gas alive. It's been going up. The dotted line is the cash flow when you sell the gas and it goes up and down depending on the price of gas. For the last two years, industry has been losing money on this because their costs are higher than their, their cash flow back. But note that the actual costs have been going up too. The reason for that is that when you, a conventional gas well, you develop it and it produces gas for 20 to 30 years if you goose it along in a low level. These new wells, uh, half of the gas produced from the well comes out in nine months. And by two years, they're completely dry. And so you need to continually keep going after them. And it takes a huge amount of capital and they're going after more and more marginal ones already as the resource is getting depleted. And so the cost is going up. This is not a sustainable, cheap source of energy either. There are futures. Let me just mention this. Many of you know of the work of Mark Jacobson of Stanford. Mark thinks that we in the United States could be completely fossil fuel free by 2030 using existing technologies if we simply put our minds and hearts to it with a little political leadership. True, the same is probably true globally. And I will point out that Mark Jacobson working with uh, many of us at Cornell has drawn up a specific plan for New York State. We believe that the state of New York can be free of fossil fuels by 2025 with aggressive action. So, shale gas is bad for global warming. It distracts, it's a false promise. It distracts the public from what really needs to be done. And of course, it's tying up financial capital that we need to, to really move ahead. And I'm, again, very, very pleased to be able to talk to you about today. So. Thank you very much.